Well, although we are in the fifth week of the year, and in the second month of the year, because of the way the um, weather has been, we're only three weeks into Epiphany, um, which is our aha season. It's the season of discovery or learning more about who God is and who exactly our Savior Jesus is. Um, we're still in the process of discovering. The past couple weeks, we've been doing a little fun quiz to figure out, to discover some new things, um, to learn a little bit. And so we're going to continue that little quiz called Fact or Fiction. Um, there will be two animal names on the screen, and you have to decide which is a factual, actual animal and which is a science fiction animal. Um, mostly based from the Star Wars universe. <sighs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so there will be four questions on the screen. Uh, four questions, and we'll just go one at a time and see which one you think is fact. Um, you, we won't be graded, you just get bragging rights for being a know-it-all. So we'll move forward here and see what, what animals you can identify. Number one, blue glaucus or a nerf, which is the real animal? Blue glaucus or a nerf? Okay, a blue glaucus is the real animal. That thing on your left is real. It's kind of cool. Looks like it should be like a space creature though. Whereas the thing on your right, that is a nerf. And next to that nerf is a nerf herder, which is an um, insult that Princess Leah calls Han Solo at some point. She calls him a nerf herder. That would be a nerf and a herder of a nerf. <sighs> Dick, you're following, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, number two. Man wolf or a loth wolf? Which is fact? Today we are going to be diving into Luke 
chapter 4 uh, to discover more about Jesus as he launches at the beginning of his ministry by preaching in his hometown. Um, as you turn to Luke chapter 4, the text will also be on the screen behind me, but we will break it down into sections. Um, I want to give a little prologue to what was happening here. So feel free to grab a Bible in the pew in front of you, um, or your own, to um, open up to Luke chapter 4. So far in Luke, after the birth of Jesus and all the Christmas story was done, Jesus gets baptized by his relative John. Um, and then directly after that, he is enters into the wilderness and is tempted by the devil. John the Baptist, during that baptism, they experience a moment where a voice from heaven declares that this is my son, my beloved. A voice declares an identity for Jesus. And then he goes into the desert where Satan repeatedly says, if you are the son of God, then do this. If you are the son of God. And pushes his limits and tests Jesus and his resistance. Satan offers Jesus an easier path than the path of the Savior, one that wouldn't provide a, a eternal significance, but would only lead to earthly power and significance. But Jesus was, knew his identity and was able to cling to the goals that God set for him and continue on, even when Satan quoted scripture at him. Satan, knowing Jesus' identity as the Son of God, and knowing Scripture, however misusing it, um, still didn't derail Jesus. So those things happen. He's claimed his identity, and he goes back to his hometown to preach. He goes back to Nazareth, like he, the place that he grew up, the place where people would have seen him go through puberty, they would have seen him go from a young boy to a man, watch him develop, learn skills from his dad, and all of those things. People, his neighbors, the ones who loved him, that's where he goes to kick things off. And so he gets to Nazareth, and he shows up on the Sabbath and walks into the synagogue, much like he had many years before that, to worship with his neighbors. And much like many years before that, he is the one that gets to read the scripture reading for that day. And so he reads the scripture reading and then hands the scroll back and sits down in a very rabbi fashion to teach the people that raised him. Let's see how they handle that. So we're going to start out by just looking at chunks at a time. Um, we're going to read Luke Four, verses 21 and 22 first. So Jesus has read, he sits down to interpret scripture, starting in 21. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious word that came from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Jesus sits down and reads a scripture from Isaiah. Isaiah talks about a person who would come and set the oppressed free, who would bring sight to the blind, this liberator, this savior. And he says that this was fulfilled today in their hearing. He doesn't directly connect the dots about who it is. He just says it's been fulfilled. He's not saying, yo, it's me. But he says it's been fulfilled. And in this moment, in his hometown, the people listening were going, wow, that's Joseph's son. And I hear it, it depending on the mood you're in, it would be easy to read this and go, oh my gosh, is that Joseph's son? Like, did he really think he could just say that? Or you could go like, is this the kid I changed his diapers? How is he grown up? Like, oh my goodness, he's just all on a pinch of cheeks. Do you see how a tone to make a complete different way of interpret, interpreting that? But we see here that they're in awe. They're amazed at his gracious words. There's an idea here that it's probably the second. 
this joy and pride swelling in them, like, like a kid from the hometown becoming um, a big deal in, in some force. Whether they're an amazing soldier that helps defend our country and they come home and we're proud of them and go, oh my goodness, look at this boy, we raised him and now look at the man he is. And in this moment we see them doing this. But Jesus isn't completely in on the moment. Though they're expressing pride in Jesus, there seems to be an ulterior motive happening at the same time. And as we dig into the next pieces of scripture, we'll see an interesting dialogue that happened. Let's read the next few verses together. Verses 23 and 24. So Jesus continues on by saying, He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. So we hear this pride that is developing in Jesus' neighbors that he grew up with. Because he's come back home, he looks like he's like this strapping young man that's about to really um, lead like a good Jewish boy does. Jesus says, hold your horses. Just because I'm stepping into this position does not mean that you are God's favorites now. It's like hearing, they're hearing, oh, we've got a celebrity on our side. I'm going to so name drop at that next party I go to. Like, yeah, me and my brother Jesus, we're tight. Like, he's a savior. And, you know, if you need anything, just let me know and I'll ask Jesus for you. And like, you'll for sure get an answer to your prayers. For sure. Like, Jesus is hearing them speak with pride and he goes, no, 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 no. I hear your, your honey-do list building for me as I'm speaking and teaching to you. I hear you salivating with wants and desires as I'm sitting here doing this for you. But... I've got a bummer for you. God doesn't play favorites. Shucks. God doesn't play favorites. In this moment, I hear, um, if you, any of you, maybe you are personally one of these, but if any of you know a plumber or an electrician or a mechanic or maybe a doctor or a nurse, somebody in the medical field, this is one of those moments where you'd be like, oh, I just need to call, I'm going to call Mark and have him come over and hang out. And maybe while he's over, he can fix my toilet. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you know, slid underneath them. Like, you know, I don't have to pay that bill because my friend's a plumber. Yeah. And Jesus is like, no, that's not how things are going to go. Let me give you some scriptural examples of why that's not going to go that way. And he continues on in his conversation, and this dialogue gets more and more intense. We're going to look at the next few verses together, verses 25 through 27. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except a widow at Zeph Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So Jesus says to them, hey, prophets aren't accepted in your hometown. And then he says to them further, you remember these like bigwigs in Jewish history? Elijah and Elisha? Yeah, they didn't even heal Jews. They went and took care of the foreigners and the Gentiles. They were in their hometowns and didn't play favorites because God doesn't play favorites. They took care of the ones who were ostracized. They took care of the outcast. Both of those examples of Elijah and Elisha, they were taking care of Gentiles, not Jews. Whew, that's uncomfortable. 
Jesus saying, you think I'm going to come and do your plumbing for free, but nope. That's not how this relationship works. Just because I come from this hometown does not mean that you have extra awesome status with God. Let's just set the record straight right now. There's no name dropping at parties or anything like that. That's not how our relationship is going to go. The, the family and neighbors that are listening here don't really handle the situation very well. Uh, let's read their reaction to what Jesus has said. Verse 28. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The people in Jesus' hometown were so mad that they didn't get to do name dropping or like a free home visit from their best friend plumber that they decided they were going to kill the child they raised. They were going to chuck him off a cliff because he didn't fit their expectations. The truth of God is infuriating. Because I don't know about you, but I would really love it if God played favorites. Obviously he'd pick me. Like, <laughs> duh. I am so great. Do you know how awesome I am? Like, obviously God should play favorites. It's infuriating and it's logical to think of why the people of Nazareth reacted the way they did. But if we take it out of, out of context, people think, oh yeah, those Jews, they misunderstand things all the time. They just, they're just there to, to be the object lesson so we know what to do. Right? But this isn't about Jews missing the point. This is about the people in his hometown representing all of us. Those moments where we think, God, I've got a great plan. If you just follow it, things are going to be great. If you just follow my itinerary, everyone will be happy. I'm going to be taken care of. My mansion will be really large. You know, all of that would be great. And God goes, but I love everybody. I don't play favorites. Everyone has an opportunity to know me. Everyone is welcomed into my home. There is no picking and choosing. Everyone has been given that opportunity. And I, you know, in my pride, was like, I've never been like those Nazareth people. Like, I'm always really good at handling what God has to say to me. And then I look at the news about how Christians are portrayed. The way we are known in this community. Or in social media. That's really fun. We really represent ourselves well on social media. I'm really, really great at it too. If you can't pick up my heavy sarcasm, I'm sorry. We have moments, some, some hot topics lately, just to poke the bear, why not, um, is people's passionate opinions about abortions and how we as Christians think, you know, life is sacred. And so um, the obvious thing is to, to yell things like, do not murder. But then in the midst of defending what we think is sacred, we also forget that there's a young, scared, pregnant woman there going, there are people who are going to judge me and condemn me in this situation. How, how, like, yes, I, I, I don't know what to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stuck in a corner. And we as Christians, in the midst of being like, oh, God picked me and is my favorite. But she, she's a little gross. God doesn't love her as much as me. She's out because of the decisions she's made. But I'm in because I'm great. And I've never made mistakes. And then we forget that this woman needs to be loved and cared for and given a safe place to process this life-impacting situation. She doesn't need us to condemn her. She needs us to love her. And I'm not talking about what, how you should vote in this moment. I'm talking about how we as Christians should live. And living is loving this individual. 
Another one I've heard uh, regularly rotated in social media is how Christians are supposed to react to homosexuals. There's a church in, in Topeka, Kansas called Westboro Baptist. Thanks for having the same title as us. That they picket <coughs> soldiers' funerals because they believe that um, a country that allows um, gay people to get married are damned and that they should protest. Their church website is GodHatesFags.com. Pardon me for saying that out loud. Yes, that is their church website. That is what people see of Christians today. Or Christians that protest bakeries because they'll bake a cake for a couple who want to get married. And we throw a fit about bakeries, but forget that that individual has been rejected so many times that maybe they just need somebody to show them love and compassion for a second for them to navigate their world. I don't know, I mean, it boggles my mind that Christians are known for throwing fits about bakeries rather than throwing fits about loving people and forgetting them. And, I, you know, once again, I pat my back and I'm like, man, I'm such a good person. <sighs> I never make mistakes. I'm really good at loving people, too. Except when I'm infuriated at God. Because God's love is unbiased. He offers his love to all people. Even the person who sexually abused me when I was young. God loves that man just as much as he loves me. And I could see why the people of Nazareth would want to chuck Jesus off a cliff in that moment. God, you should play favorites. I know who should be your favorite. Me, not that one. Obviously, I'm the best out of these two. I've made less mistakes in this circumstance. Pick me, not him. And Jesus is saying here, oh, no, no, no. I don't play favorites. Everyone has an invitation to redemption. And that is the infuriating gospel of Jesus. The infuriating story. That sometimes we as Christians have this idea in our head and are so determined to be right that we cease to love people. That in the midst of my baggage, I forget who God loves. And that it's not just about me. That my faith should be grounded in God's will, not my will for God. It's not a fun thing to think about. Because it would be much easier for me to go, God, I have an itinerary for you. I have a honey-do list for you. Here you go. I'm waiting. And also, here's the timelines for these. Like, here's my list of wants and do them now. But God's saying, no, no, no. This faith is not about you. It's about my love for all people. It is about an opportunity for all people to know me. Not for you to play the judge and not for you to be the one standing at the door checking people's tickets to see if they should be admitted. I am the one that sets the one aside. I am the one that says who's in and who's out. You are my people. You are just, you are meant to be my people who show love and call people in to a life where they can be transformed. And I determine how they're transformed. You don't get to determine that either. I know that would be really fun. If we could just say, oh, I would love to invite this, this hot mess of a person to church because I have a really great plan about scrubbing them up. I'm going to cut their hair. I'm going to put them in different clothes. And they're just going to, you know, I'm going to clean up their words. And they're just, oh, they're going to shine for Jesus. When God said, no, no, no. I determine the path of their holiness. I determine their transformation. You're, you and me are working on you. I just want you to give other people the opportunity to come in and for us to work on it. On each other. It's a hard and heavy thing to think about that as Jesus kicks off his ministry in his hometown, his hometown discovers the tough reality that God doesn't play favorites in the gospel that Jesus is there for is for all people to be invited into. 
It's uncomfortable and it's scary. The gospel of Jesus is very radical. His ministry, life, and resurrection isn't about drawing lines or picking favorites. But rather, it's about declaring that all people are loved by God and have an invitation to join the family. It's like Jesus showing up to an IU game in a Purdue jersey. <coughs> and everybody's going, Jesus, you're supposed to root for my team. And he's like, no, 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 no. I don't play favorites, but if you're going to play favorites, like, I'm going to root for the underdog. I'm wanting everybody to feel like they are welcome in here. Everyone is welcome. And so today, we are going to be participating in communion together with the gravity and the heaviness of the gospel in the air. When we take the bread and the juice, it's not about us submitting our to-do list to God, but us saying, God, give us direction. Transform me. Let me stop listening to this sermon and think, oh, this person needs to hear this. They would be so changed. And instead, think about what do I need to hear in this moment and be transformed. We submit to God's will, not our own. We submit to God's grace, not our own justice, vengeance, or mercy. He defines the terms, not us. And when we celebrate communion, we are reminding ourselves that our faith is grounded in Him, not in us. <coughs> it's not in my wish list that I've submitted through prayer. Insert prayer against stuff. But it's grounded in God's desire for all people to know His love, grace, and salvation. So today, we celebrate the life of Jesus and the discovery that He is for all people. Not just ones we like. Shoot, I don't really like that. And today we come to this table to remind ourselves that it's God's will, God's will, not our own, that dictates our faith. Today we participate in the sacred act and ask God's spirit to work in us to transform us to be the people he built us to be. Paul gave instructions to a group of Christians that were struggling to understand what it meant to not play favorites. He gave them instructions on what it meant to, to do the Lord's Supper and to do church together. And I'm really grateful for the words he said in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord, on the, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <coughs> For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul had to correct the abuses of the First Corinthian church who were using the Lord's Supper to get fat and drunk and say, no, 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 God doesn't play favorites in this moment. This is, this is a place of equalizing. This is a place for everybody. You don't get a double portion of my grace. You all get the same amount. And so as we celebrate communion together, I want you to know that you are welcome at this table, even if just in this moment, you are accepting Jesus. This is a place for somebody at stage one or level 100. Maybe I'll like level two. This is, this is a place for all to be welcomed and to know that they are welcomed in God's family. The invitation is there. For practical steps, I want you to know that um, in a moment I'll invite the, the deacons up um, and you'll be invited up to the table. You'll be able to get a piece of bread and um, that Heather wonderfully makes for us each week, um, and some juice. And then I ask you to take it to your seat and hold on to it. 
um, until we've all had our elements and we'll take them together. Uh, if you're not sure what to do during that time, you're welcome to practice breathing like we did earlier in the service, um, or pray, or simply contemplate the gift that you are given, everybody else in this room is given to. Everybody gets the, the same thing. God doesn't play favorites. Let's pray together. God, we ask you um, once again to move in this space. We ask that your presence be in a real way in this symbolic act that we do. That as we eat this bread and drink this juice, that is more to us than just tasty things. That we feel the universal gift you offer everyone. That everyone is offered an invitation into the family. We are offered an invitation to the table. And it is our responsibility to respond to that invitation. We thank you that you are a God that doesn't play favorites. That you are a God that loves unconditionally. That offers justice at the same time as mercy in ways beyond we can comprehend. Especially in moments where we would rather de de demand vengeance. Lord, we ask you to, to work on our hearts that we are able to set free our hearts from a, a need to have a hierarchy, a need to have a God that plays favorites, and to see you as a God that opens doors and works on us individually so that we can collectively glorify you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity to remember your gifts, and we pray that this is something that sticks in us throughout our week. Amen. I'd like to invite the deacons forward to serve. The invitation stands. Come to the table.
May we cling tightly to the invitation offered to us, not playing favorites of who is offered to you, and doing this in remembrance of him. At the end of our service, we, um, for those of you that are new, we'd stand and join hands and sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. This is a reminder to us of the unity that we find in Christ, the, the leveling playing field, the equalizer that is the foot of the cross. So I ask you to stand with us. I know it can be an uncomfortable thing sometimes to hold hands with a stranger, but the symbolism is beautiful. <laughs> I'm strange, but not a stranger. Yeah, that's fine. giving them all the opportunity to be loved and transformed by God in their unique 